is in differential geometry, uh, and I know most of the audience are, are, are the more algebraic geometry background, and I'm sure that there are uh, competing ways or alternative ways of understanding a lot of what I'm going to talk about, which you probably find a little more uh, insight to offer. One reason I'm here is so that I can talk to people and, and find out uh, what algebraic um, geometry can uh, contribute to this, this kind of problem. Uh, I'd say I found algebraic geometry pretty impenetrable, so you have to be patient with me when, you, when you're explaining stuff because it doesn't seem to be very easy. Okay, anyway, so this is going to be from a very differential geometry, uh, and I hope that's okay. Yeah, so this is joint work with my ex PhD student, Rene Garcia Lara, who's now at the uh, University of Yucatan. Okay, what's it about? Well, so we're going to study the absolutely most basic, simple modular space of vortices you could possibly write here. So the, the uh, target space is just going to be a complex line, uh, the gauge group is just U1, and the domain is just a two-sphere. Okay, so you can't get much simpler than that. Um, the only slight complication is I'm not going to assume that the two-sphere has a round metric, so this whole game depends on your choice of metric on your domain in an interesting way, and I'm not going to assume <coughs> that this is the usual sort of round metric. It could be absolutely any metric you like. So this two-sphere could look like a child's party balloon for all I know. It could be very complicated. Okay, so we have a Hermitian line bundle L over uh, this possibly complicated two-sphere uh, on which I've chosen an orientation. And um, associated to any section of that line bundle and um, uh, metric compatible connection A, we're going to associate the usual yang rule sigs energy. So take the squared L2 norm of the uh, gauge covariant derivative of phi, uh, add half the squared L2 norm of the curvature of, of the connection, and then this, uh, this potential here is, of course, half the L2 norm squared of the moment map is obvious on the section, the moment map um, generating the one action. And there's this parameter here because I can always shift the uh, moment map value any constant I like. So tau is going to be an interesting parameter for our point of view. Whoops. Um, yeah, so this is just some, uh, some positive room on tau. And that, that parameter is going to be uh, crucial in what we do. Okay, so as we probably all know, there's this thing called the bottom line. So if the degree of the line bundle is, is, is n, then it says that, that uh, the lowest that energy could possibly be is tau times pi times n, and you attain that bound if and only if your section and your connection satisfy this couple pair of first order uh, PDs. Okay, so phi has to be holomorphic with respect to the holomorphic structure defined by your connection A. And the Hodge dual of the, of the curvature of the uh, uh, just uh, equal the moment map as it were, so half tau times one, uh, tau minus five squared. Uh, you notice that there's no facts of i here because I've just I've just used the obvious identification for the algebra of u one. Uh, so that's the imaginary reals. I just identify <laughs> identify the imaginary complex numbers with, with the real one. Okay, so there's going to be no factor of i floating Okay, so um, this, this is an interesting fact. So this uh, energy is bounded below by this topological, uh, topological quantity, tau times pi times n, uh, with equality if and only if this pair of PDs uh, is satisfied. So Bradlow made this uh, very simple but astute observation, which is that if you integrate the second uh, PD over the, over the surface sigma, uh, you find that there's a constraint. So if you just go to the left hand side, of course, you can just get two pi times the degree of line bundle. That's the topological invariant. On the right hand side, you get half tau times the area of your surface minus half the L2 norm square of your section. So it turns out that every solution of this uh, system of equations, so solutions are called the vortices, of course, uh, they all have the same L2 norm. And the squared L2 norm is always equal to this constant here. 
tau times the area of sigma. So when I put a space between vertical lines, I just need an area or volume. Uh, tau times the area of sigma and minus 4 pi m. Okay? Well, since that's the squared L2 norm of something, of course, it can't be negative. And it's going to appear all over the place in the rest of the talk, so let me give it a name. I'm going to call it epsilon. Okay? So this is a type, actually. It shouldn't say epsilon. It has to be bigger than zero. Of course, it has to be bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, so this is the system I'm interested in. Very, very old, very well studied, very easy to understand. Uh, in particular, we're going to be interested in the moduli space of solutions of that pair of equations. So the vortex moduli space, Mn. So that's the space of solutions of that pair of equations modular the action of the gauge group. That's you don't expect. And the structure of that moduli space depends crucially on uh, the value of the parameter epsilon. Right? So as I've already explained, if epsilon is negative, the common instance is at all. So the moduli space is empty, epsilon is negative. If, on the other hand, epsilon is zero, what's that saying? Well, remember, epsilon is the, is the L2 norm, well, it's the square of the L2 norm of the section phi. Okay, so if epsilon is zero, every solution has uh, a section with L2 norm zero. Okay, so of course that means the section must be zero. Um, so the only solu all solutions have uh, uh, phi equals zero, but then if you look on the, uh, the second equation there, that's just saying that um, uh, your connection has to have constant curvature. Right? Okay, so the moduli space of solutions in the case when epsilon equals zero is precisely the moduli space of constant curvature connections. And we're on a two-sphere, so there's only one to get. Okay, so um, in this particular very simple case, the moduli space is a single point. Okay. That single point consists of a pair, zero section, constant curvature connection. Much more interesting, of course, is the case where epsilon is positive, then it turns out the moduli space is bihormorphic to CPO. Okay? So this is just um, reiterating what I just told you when epsilon is zero, the moduli space is a single point consisting of zero section and constant curvature connection. And when epsilon is bigger than zero, well, then what Bradley showed is that uh, solutions of this equation, modular gauge, are uniquely determined by degree and effective divisors uh, on your surface. So everything I'm saying up to now, pretty much, well, apart from that bit, it generalizes to, to general compact on the surfaces. Um, so this is true more generally, but in particular, it, you know, if you think about this in the case where your surface is a two-sphere, then there's a very nice way of thinking about what the space of degree and effective divisors is. Okay, so it's a, it's a collection of n unmarked points on the sphere, sorry, n marked points on the sphere without labels, so without, um, without choosing an order for them, right? So how do you specify uh, n points on the two sphere, possibly with repetition, so without any choice of ordering them? Well, the answer is you just write down a polynomial using a stereographic coordinate whose roots are those points, okay? So you, whatever the section set of n points is, and the, you, you could have points at infinity, in which case your polynomial would have to be degree less than n. You can always write down uh, a polynomial, a degree, at most n, with roots of those points, right? But then, of course, taking your polynomial and multiplying it by a non-zero constant, complex constant, gives you exactly the same, gives you a different polynomial, but gives you exactly the same set of roots. So if you, if you want to parameterize the set of, uh, of marked points, then you should take the projective equivalence class defined by the coefficients of this polynomial. Okay? So that's a very direct way of seeing that the moduli space, which in general is just a symmetric, the n fold symmetric product of, the, of, the, of your Riemann surface of itself, n times. In the case where your surface is a two sphere, there's this very nice way of identifying the CPN. Okay, so that's what the moduli space is, it's just CPN, but this kind of version of CPN. Okay, so um, the thing that interests me about this moduli space is not so much as topology. Um, yeah, everything you could possibly know about that is already known, of course. Um, it's the fact that it carries a natural Riemannian metric. And the natural Riemannian metric, from my point of view, is defined in, in a very simple and, uh, and direct way. So how do you, th how do you think of a, a, a tangent vector to the moduli space? Well, if I just take a curve of solutions of the vortex equations, so smooth curve of solutions, then of course that defines a curve in the space of equivalence classes of solutions as well. Okay, and tangent vectors are equivalence classes of smooth curves. Uh, therefore, of course, it defines a tangent vector. Let's call it V. Okay, so associated to any 
Cur smooth curve with solutions of the, of the vortex equations there is an associated tangent vector to the modular space at the equivalence mass of uh, the point that it goes to at time zero. Okay, so what we want to do is, do, is just define the length of that, right, in general. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, what we do is, I mean, the, the, the snappy way of saying it, as, as was pointed out to me by, uh, by my PhD student Gorsum, is just to say, well, you've got uh, a projection from the set of all solutions of what is supposed to be the moduli space, the, the thing which just functions from the A direction. Uh, there's an obvious metric on the space of all solutions because that that's, lives in the space of all connections and sections, which has a, a natural metric called the L2 metric. So there's an induced metric on the space of all solutions. Let's just define the metric on MN so that that mapping is a, is a Riemannian submersion. Okay, and that's that's exactly what this definition here is saying. Okay? Except that's a bit formal because things are infinite dimensional on, on the top. Okay, so what do we do? We take our tangent vector V. Um, we, think we, you know, we compute phi dot of zero, a dot of zero, which is sort of representing v, and we project it L2 orthogonal to the gauge orbit through phi of zero, a of zero. Okay. And once we've done that, we take the this, this squared L2 norm of the thing after, after projection. What do you mean by the gauge orbit? If we phi of zero, a of zero, it's not, that's an infinite dimensional space? You're saying phi of zero, a of zero lives in a finite dimensional space? Uh, so t zero is just a parameter, right? It, I'm taking a curve of solutions. So phi of zero, a of zero is a section about in the product connection, specific connections, specific sections. Yeah, yeah no, so I, I understand what you meant. So that's, yeah. that's a section about and a connection, and th this is a section about and a one form. I got you, yeah. Okay, okay. okay good. Um, so yeah, we, we just take this, uh, this thing which is you know, a section of L and a one form, that's all it is, uh, and of course there's an inner product on, on the fiber, and there's an inner product on, on, my, on my sphere sigma, so I know how to take square norms of, uh, of one forms and so on. Uh, and that's it, that, that, that's the squared length of the tangent vector V. Okay? So that is how I define the L2 metric, and I'm, I'm sure there are a lot more um, elegant ways of doing it, but this one is the one I like. So why do I like it? Well, it controls the low energy dynamics of vortices. So at the moment, you could just think of that as being a definition. Really. What, 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 is, what do you mean by dynamics of vortices? So each one of these points <coughs> in your modular space, you think of it as being a static, a static um, solution of a field theory consisting of n vortices dotted around on your sphere. And then to define the dynamics, you want them to move around and interact. So how can you do that? Well, one obvious way to do it is just to define geodesic flow on the moduli space of static n vortices, right? And then as time progresses, the, you know, your divisor evolves in time, and the, the, the positions where um, your Higgs field vanishes, they move around, and, uh, and you get some kind of vortex dynamics. OK, so that's not, it isn't actually as trivial as that. There, there was a competing <laughs> definition of vortex dynamics, which you get by taking the energy function I started off with, taking your domain and swapping it for a Lorentzian manifold with, with a Lorentzian metric. Um, and then write down exactly the same function which I was calling energy before, but in this Lorentzian setting, now it's called action. Do the calculus of variations, you get, you get a, a, a hyperbolic, a nonlinear high coupled set of hyperbolic <laughs> sort of wave equations. And that defines the dynamics for, for the fields. And then it turns out you can prove, and this is what Stuart did, uh, that in the, in, the, in the low velocity limit, the dynamics defined by the Cauchy problem for this PDE, this field theory problem, uh, actually does reduce to due to the motion on the Okay, so it's not just plugged out of thin air, there is, there is a, a background story to it. Uh, it also controls um, quantum vortex dynamics. Maybe I'll get onto that a little bit later. Okay, so what's known about this? Well, lots of things known. What, the, the, the main nice thing about it is that it's a Kahle metric. So there's obviously a natural complex structure on the modular space, and it turns out that. Uh, this 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 uh, Riemannian metric is compatible with that in, in, in the natural way you would expect. Okay, so unfortunately, there's no formula for the L2 metric, uh, except in extremely simple cases. Uh, but there is a formula for its Kähler class, uh, which was written down in the level of general I'm talking about by Gerard Baptista, and 
once you know the Kähler class, of course, that's enough to compute the volume of the modular space. Uh, so it turns out that the volume of this modular space is pi to the n epsilon to the n divided by n factorial. Okay, remember epsilon is this parameter. Let me just remind you what it is. It's 4 pi n. No, it isn't. It's tau times the area of single minus 4 pi. Okay, so uh, you can see that as epsilon goes to zero, which you can either think of as being fixing the area of a surface and shrinking tau to a critical value, or fixing tau and shrinking the area of your surface. E1 is equally good. Um, yeah, the volume shrinks to zero. Okay, so the, what we have here is a one parameter family of metrics, uh, but at one end, the volume at least is, is shrinking to zero, so something funny is happening. So it's convenient for that reason just to rescale the L2 metric to get rid of that. Okay, so when I talk about the L2 metric from now on, I really need to rescale the L2 metric, which is just the L2 metric divided by epsilon. So now that has <laughs> you, um, normalized volume pi to the n over n factor. Okay. All right, so what we have here is a one parameter family of Kähler metrics on CPM, or on, on a space which is biholomorphic to CPM. <laughs> Just some positive real parameter. Okay? So there are two obvious limits to think about, right? Epsilon goes to infinity, epsilon goes to zero. So it turns out that the, the limit as epsilon goes to infinity has been studied by other people. So it was studied by Nuno and Ignacy, um, who never wrote it up for, for whatever reason. Um, and it was also studied by this guy in Nagy. That's not the Hungarian communist who was executed by the Soviets. I think there are a lot of Nazis, actually, it's like Smith in Hungary. Um, anyway, so yeah, the, 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 the limit when epsilon goes to infinity was studied in particular by this guy here, who was invited to this meeting but couldn't make it, as I understand it. Uh, so what happens in that limit? Well, you can think of that as being the limit where you inflate the surface, right? And the, and the vortices basically have fixed size. That's one way of thinking of it. Um, so, or you can think of it as being you, you, you um, fix the surface and you take tau to infinity. Either way, what happens is that the vortices become point-like. So the ratio between the size of the vortex core and the surface goes to zero. And the, the vortices as particles become more and more particle-like and the L2 metric converges basically to the product metric on the outside the diagonal. Yeah, we suppose we're converge it, yeah. Yes, of course, this is not the product metric on this is not really a Riemannian metric. So, where it makes sense for it to converge, it converges, yes. And the rate of convergence is not uniform, you have to take a compact set. But anyway, yes, this is not a precise statement, but it gives you the rough flavor. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, an interesting, uh, that's an interesting limit, but I'm going to be interested in the opposite limit, the dissolving limit. So in that limit, your, your surface is getting very small. It's going to just, you know, it's, it's approaching this uh, lower bound, the Bradley limit. Or um, you're, you're, you're scaling tau down, and your vortices are getting big in complex the size of the surface. And what's happening? Well, actually, at the limit, of course, phi is zero. So your your and the and the connection has constant curvature. So what's happening is that the vortices are spreading out and kind of completely losing their individuality. And you're just getting this completely dissolved, uh, delocalized thing. Okay. So this is an interesting limit. It's called the dissolving limit. And one reason it's interesting is because there's a precise conjecture due to Baptista and Mantel from 2003 about what happens to the L2 metric. They conjectured that the L2 metric in this limit converges in a sense that they never made precise to the free beams <coughs> on CPM. Okay. So that's the that's the result which. Me and Rene have proved. Rene and I have proved, I suppose. Mm. Um, and that's what I was telling you. Okay. But at the moment, it's not very precise, right? Because first of all, I haven't told you in what sense this limit is, is, is attained. Uh, but even worse, I haven't told you what I mean by the Fubini Studio metric. Remember, this, this thing here is a metric not on CPM, but on a space which is biholomorphic to CPM. On a one parameter family of spaces which are biholomorphic to CPM. But this is the modular space of n vortices, so a parameter epsilon, right? So, uh, for the first thing I have to do is make precise what I, exactly what I mean by the right-hand side, because that's not immediately obvious. Okay, so here we go. So how do we make this conjecture precise? 
Um, so what we do is we create our um, line button, which up to now it's just, it was just a smooth line button. We didn't have a whole model. We equip it with a holomorphic structure whose D-bar operator is precisely the 0, 1 part of the gauge covariant booth with respect to A hat, where remember A hat was our choice of um, constant curvature connection. Okay, so we choose a particular constant curvature connection, we never change it. We take its D-bar operator and, we, and that defines the holomorphic structure. Uh, lambda. Okay, so then Associated with that, of course, there's a space of polymorphic sections, which is some n plus one dimensional complex vector space. There it is. Okay, and this space has an actual inner product on it, right? The L2 inner product. Okay, so I can define the unit sphere in this space with respect to the L2 inner product. Um, there it is. And then there's a natural, uh, there's the hop vibration, there's a natural map from this unit sphere in this space to the space of lines to the origin in that space, right? I just take a point of the inner sphere and map it to the lines to the origin containing that point. Okay? And then I equip this space here, this projector space here, with the Riemannian metric, which is designed specifically so that that mapping there is a Riemannian submersion. That is the Fubini student metric. That's what you mean by the Fubini student metric. Okay? Um, so this is the Fubini student metric of constant holomorphic circular curvature 2. Okay, but of course it's defined on this space here, the space of projected equivalence classes of points in your space of holomorphic sections. This is not the moduli space. Right? This is not the moduli space. So in order to tell you what I mean by the Fubini student metric in the context I'm talking about, I need to write down a, a mapping from my moduli space to this space here. And there's an obvious way to do that. So I can take a, a, a vortex. So a, a gauge equivalence class of vortices, remember that's uniquely determined by its divisor. I then map that to the line to the origin in this space consisting of non-zero sections with the same divisor. There you go. So that's a, a biholomorphism from my moduli space to this uh, projective space. This projective space is a natural Fubini studio metric we find using the L2 in a product. I pull that back. And that is what I mean by the Fubini studio metric on MF. Okay, so the Baptiste de conjecture, more, more explicitly, is that the limit as epsilon tends to zero of this family of metrics, G epsilon, is this Fubini studio metric, which I call G0. And I just want to stop at this point and point out that's rather surprising. Because remember, the, 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 the sphere I started off with wasn't assumed to be round. So generically, it has no non trivial isometries at all. Okay, the moduli space of vortices. Correspondingly, generically has no isometries whatsoever. And yet in this limit, it's converging to a symmetric space. It's converging to something with a huge amount of symmetry, a with constant holomorphic section of curvature. So this is, on the face of it, quite a surprising thing. Okay, so that's the conjecture. To say it's a theorem, you need to say exactly what you mean by limit. Okay, so what do I mean by limit? Here it is. So in the limit, the epsilon approaches zero from above. G epsilon converges in C0, it's apologies to G0. To G0. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's the nice clean statement. The thing that we actually prove which implies that is something rather stronger. Um, namely, that there exists a constant, depending on N and depending on your choice of, um, uh, of, of, of geometry metric on the two sphere, there exists a constant bigger than zero, such that for all tangent vectors to the moduli space. If you look at the, the square length of the vector with respect to G epsilon, subtract off the square length with respect to the Fubini student metric, look at the difference, the distance between those two numbers, then that's bounded by this uniform constant, which doesn't depend on which vortex you're talking about, doesn't depend on the, on the tangent vector, times the square length with respect to the Fubini student metric. This, this is what we actually prove, but it immediately implies the thing above. Okay. So I'm not going to tell you about the proof. Uh, yes. So we'll see how much you enjoy this. I don't know. Um, you, you might like it, you might not. Um, so how, how do you prove this? Well, the first thing to prove is that, well, we introduced this notion called pseudo uh, and, and, the, and the, the, the guts of the proof really is to prove that vortex solutions are well approximated by these things called pseudo -morphosis. So what's a pseudo -morphosis? Well. If you give me a divisor D, an effective divisor of degree N, 
then I can always find a holomorphic section with respect to this fixed holomorphic structure of unit L2 norm whose divisor is D, of course. And that's unique up to multiplication by root of the IC where C is a constant. Okay. So if I fix a divisor D, I can come up with one of these things in this unit, in this unit sphere. And then a pseudo, the corresponding pseudo vortex is precisely this. It's the section of L root epsilon times phi hat, comma, constant curvature connection A hat. Okay? So what, that's what I call a pseudo vortex. Why do I call it a pseudo vortex? Well, first of all, it satisfies the first vortex equation vacuously. The first vortex equation just says that this section has to be holomorphic with respect to the holomorphic structure defined by that connection, right? But it is by definition. Right? I chose phi hat to have that problem. Yeah. Secondly, it doesn't satisfy the second vortex equation, but remember that if you integrate the second vortex equation over sigma, that tells you precisely that the L2 norm of phi hat has to be epsilon. The L2 norm squared has to be epsilon. So by construction, this thing also satisfies not V2, but the thing that you get by integrating V2 over your surface. Okay? Okay, so of course this is not really a vortex, except when epsilon equals zero. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to take that and I want to deform it in such a way that I get to the correct thing, the actual real vortex. So how do I do that? Well, with the same divisor. Okay. Well, whatever the vortex is, it must, it must have something in its equivalence, in its gauge equivalence class of this form. So where I take root epsilon phi hat and I multiply it by e to the u over 2, where u is some smooth uh, real value function, right? Okay, but then that won't satisfy... Um, the first vortex equation with respect to A hat, in order to make sure it satisfies the first vortex equation, and I also need to deform, the, I need to do a corresponding deformation of the connection, right? So I replace A hat by A hat minus a half Hodge dual of du, and then it turns out that that pair automatically satisfies the first vortex equation for any choice of uh, smooth function u. Okay? Uh, then it satisfies the second vortex equation if and only if you satisfies this nice uh, similar PDE where delta is the Laplacian on, on vortices. Okay, now if you know Bradlow's proof of existence of vortices, this will look very familiar to you because it, it's almost the same idea, but you approach from a slightly different angle. But also, your, your, you know, this notion of pseudo vortex, this is also what uh, you know, this discussion by Batista. Yes, and yes, yes. They, I mean, of course, they worked in the, in the, in the, in the round sphere. There was a round sphere, and then so it's very similar. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, yes. yes. Sorry, I, I should have said that. Um, you're right. The, 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 the idea of pseudo vortex, that's what led them to the conjecture in the first place. Okay, so this, this thing here satisfies the vortex equation, is a genuine vortex solution. Um, only if you satisfy this quite a nice um, semi-linear PDE. Um, okay, so so what? Well, you can now do estimates on this PDE. So you can you can put together an energy estimate, an elliptic estimate, and a Sobolev inequality to deduce that the C0 norm of U is bounded by some uniform constant depending on the n and G sigma uh, times epsilon. Okay, so this is saying, if you think about it, that vortices are uniformly well approximated by pseudo vortices for small epsilon. Okay, so this, the, the key point is that this thing C doesn't depend on which divisor you're talking about. It's, it's true. There's a, there's a constant that works on the whole moduli space. Okay, um, so I was going to unpack that a little bit, maybe. Uh, so I started, what, 20, just after 20 best? Yeah. And, uh, Maybe I should have 30 minutes. I've had 30 minutes. Sorry, uh, no. Um, we've got 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. No, in that case, maybe I, maybe I can go through this in, in a little bit. Uh, okay, so, so that, that, that statement there, energy estimate, literary estimate, Sobolev, implies that. I mean, if you're, if you're an analyst, then that's probably like, yeah, okay, yeah, that's obvious. Uh, if you're not an analyst, then it's probably not obvious at all. And maybe it's useful for me to, uh, and I'm not an analyst, by the way. Um, it's possibly useful for me to unpack that a bit. Okay, so first of all, what's, what's the first thing? The Sobol Sobolev inequality. So the Sobolev inequality in this particular case says that the set of um, smooth, the set of functions mapping sigma to R with a finite H2 norm, where the H2 norm squared is this thing here, integral of u squared plus integral of du squared plus integral of, of derivative of du squared. Um, 
that space is a subset of the set of all continuous maps, so every such thing is continuous, and the inclusion into the set of continuous maps is continuous. Okay, so that's what this inequality is. So you, the, 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 the C0 norm is bounded by this control by the H2 norm. Okay, so I want to show that this is small. This is saying, well, it's good enough to show that actually the H2 norm is small. Okay. Second degree is the same, um, standard elliptic estimate for the Laplacian this from the two Okay, so what's that? Well, the standard elliptic estimate for an elliptic operator, say if you need to, just to have, have ordered two, I should say, just to keep it concrete, um, says that uh, for all smooth functions L2 orthogonal to the kernel of the operator, you can bound the HK norm of the function by the HK minus two norm of, of, of its image under the operator, okay? So to control the H2 norm of Hume, it's enough to control the H2, the H0 norm, i.e. the L2 norm of the image of you under your operator. Okay? So the difference between 0 and 2, that's because it's an order 2 operator. If it's an order 3 operator, it would be 3. If it's order 1 operator, it would be 1, etc. Okay? So this is true not in general, but only for, for functions which are L2 or functions of the kernel of the operator. Of course, the kernel of the Laplacian is just the spanned by the constant function 1. So this is really just saying, all functions with average zero satisfy this inequality. Okay? All right, so that's what I mean by a standard elliptic estimate for the Laplacian. Um, okay, so, yeah, I, I'd like to use this fact here to get a bound on this, and I'd like to use that here, but unfortunately the function u doesn't have average zero. There's no reason to think it has average zero, so I have to work a bit to be able to do this. So what you do is you decompose u into its average zero piece plus its average, and then you know that uh, when you substitute that into this into the PD set of by U, you get this thing here. Okay. You then integrate that over sigma, and you get this equation here, which you can solve <coughs> for, for its average. Okay, so just from the PD, you can deduce that the average of U must have this one, is equal to this quantity here. Okay, so it's uniquely determined, the average of U is uniquely determined by its average plus part. Okay, and then using monotonicity of log and exponential and the fact that it phi has L2 and 1, it immediately follows that uh, the absolute value of the average is bounded above by the C0 norm of its average plus part. Okay, so what have we got? To bound the C0 norm of U, from this fact it's enough to bound the C0 norm of its average part. Of its, of its average was part. Uh, from the Sobolev inequality, it's good enough to bound the H2 norm of this average was part. From the standard elliptic estimate, because the average was part is L2 orthogonal to the kernel of Laplacian, it's actually good enough to bound the H, sorry, the L, that should be the L2 norm of, uh, of, uh, of the Laplacian of U norm. Uh, but the Laplacian of U is the same as the Laplacian of U, of course, because they differ by a constant. And if you think about the, the, what, U, what U is, um, the Laplacian of U is the difference between the curvature of the connection A and the, const, the curvature of the constant curvature connection, so it's, it's really the same as that. So it's good enough, actually, to bound this, you just need to bound the L2 norm of the curvature of your connection. Okay, but that's, an, uh, that's a, a, a one term in the energy, so it's good enough to bound the energy. Uh, but of course, the energy is a constant. This is times constant. Okay, so from that, you get that your function u, defining this deformation, is uniformly bounded. And then you bootstrap. So now, you know that u0 satisfies this PDE, okay? So now, and you also know that u is uniformly bounded, so from that, you can, and the fact that there are epsilons here and here, you can immediately get that the C0 norm of the Laplacian of u0 is bounded by like that, from which, using the same chain of arguments, you get that the C0 norm of u0. Is bounded. Okay, so that's how you prove that vortices are well approximated by pseudo vortices. Uh, but of course, we need to estimate the metric. So how do you do that? Well, we use the definition of the metric. So you, you start off by taking a curve of solutions of, of vortex equations. You then write them as a curve in the space of, of uh, in this unit sphere in the space of holomorphic sections, and a curve of deformation functions satisfying your PDE. Okay. 
Uh, you could, by definition, the this thing phi hat has unit L2 norm, so it follows by differentiation that its, uh, it's velocity vector is L2 orthogonal to itself. With that elastic generality, you can choose your curve so that actually it also, also moves orthogonal to the hybrid part of the hot vibration. Um, and that, that's nice because then the the length squared of the tangent vector with respect to G0 is precisely L2 norm squared of this section. So it's a very simple thing to think about. Okay, so then you differentiate this expression here and you note that the, the, uh, this, this tangent vector is controlled by the rate of change of U. Okay, which satisfies the PU you get by differentiating this along the parameter T. Okay, so now this is just a nice uh, linear elliptic PDE with an inhomogeneous term rather than a term on the right hand side. So your, your first thought, if you're me at least, is, oh, let's just use the standard elliptic estimate for not the Laplacian anymore, but for this operator here. Okay, this operator is nice because this potential term vanishes only on the divisor, so it, it's positive everywhere else, so it's obvious it has a trivial kernel. Okay, so there's none of this business about, you, know, you have to be able to orthogonal to the kernel, the kernel's, the kernel's just a zero, so. Okay, but, so morally what you do is you apply this, the, the standard elliptic estimate for this operator here to get, to get, um, to get a, an H2 estimate on U dot. Now that's, that's a complete mess of lie, what I just told you, okay? So the reality is, of course, the, the, the bounding constant, the coercivity constant for this operator depends on the device and it depends on epsilon. Okay, so what I just said there is hopelessly simplistic, really. You have to work a lot harder. And this is this was really um, Rene's uh, contribution to, to the whole project, uh, proving a very nice estimate using the Lex Milgram lemma to handle this particular stuff. Anyway, you can prove this, but it doesn't quite follow the way that I'm pretending it does in this in this slide. Mm -hmm. And that's good enough to bound to get the bound. Uh, I had this one. Uh, the difference between G epsilon and G zero. Okay, so that's basically a sketch of the proof. Um, I want to say something about what the what what does C zero convergence buy you? Well, one interesting thing it buys you is it buys you convergence of the spectrum of the Laplace. Okay, so if you have a Riemannian a, a compact Riemannian manifold with that boundary, you can always write down the Laplace on it. Okay, so minus the with this gradient, um, or the Hodge Laplace, however you want to think of it. Um, it has, you know, it has eigenvalues, it has a spectrum. The spectrum always has a nice form. You've got uh, the, the eigenvalue is zero. Uh, that's um, never degenerate, so there's always, the, the eigenspace for that is always one dimensional span by constant functions. Then you can arrange all the other, other eigenvalues in increasing order, call them lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, etc. And they don't accumulate anywhere. They diverge to infinity with no uh, accumulation. Okay, so this is what the spectrum of the Laplace on a compact manifold always looks like. And of course, it depends in some very complicated way that it's hard to understand on the metric, which is why I've written of G. Okay, so a corollary of the, 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 the metric estimate that I, um, whose proof I outlined uh, ten minute, a few minutes ago, is that actually the spectrum, you see, we've got this one parameter family of metrics, G epsilon. Uh, converging in C0 to, to be the it actually follows just from that that um, the spectrum of the Laplacian converges uniformly, that is the whole spectrum converges in this sense to the spectrum of the Fubini pseudomagic, which is of course you can, you can look at a book, it's very, very simple and well known. Okay, so there exists a constant and some epsilon star being zero, so, so for all indices k and for all epsilon in zero to epsilon star, uh, this inequality that it holds. And I want to point, so the spectrum of LM converges uniformly to the spectrum of the Fubini signature. And I want to again point out this is not at all obvious. In fact, this is very, very surprising that this is true. Because if you write down the Laplacian in, <laughs> in, um, oh, sorry, it's not, it's not surprising that this is true. It's surprising that we can prove it with the estimate that we, that we have. That's what's surprising. Because if you, if you look at, if you look at what the Laplacian, the structure of the Laplacian in local form, this one's look like. So you've got the inverse metric coefficients times the second, second order derivatives. But then you've also got something involving the Christoffel symbols. Uh, okay, all we've proved is that these things, G, are uniformly converging to the corresponding coefficients for the Fubini student metric. We have not proved that their derivatives are converging. So we absolutely do not know 
that these coefficients here are converging to the corresponding things for the Fubini stoichiometry. We know nothing about it at all. They might not be converging to anything at all. They might be diverging for all we know. And if you take a family of operators like this, where all you know is that the principal part converges, but there's a, a lower order part which doesn't necessarily converge, it is absolutely not true in general that the spectrum will converge. Okay, you can easily write down examples where it doesn't, unless something weird happens. So it's absolutely crucial that we're talking about the, the Laplace in here. Okay, this will not be true for more general operators than the than, than, than. Okay, So why is it following this case? case? Well, it's because of a really beautiful um, uh, result of Urukar and Bando from the 1980s, which gives you a, 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 a beautiful way of thinking about the spectrum of the Laplace in the following way. So remember, G is now just a fixed metric associated to any finite dimensional subspace of the space of, of smooth functions on your manifold. So just take a fi any finite dimensional space, uh, subspace of the space of smooth functions. Um, take the supremum of the Rayleigh equations evaluated for functions in that finite dimensional subspace. It's just a real one. <coughs> Is this the thing? A function which takes a finite dimensional subspace, spits out a real one. Then it turns out that the kth um, the value of the Laplacian is precisely the infimum of that function over all subspaces of dimension k plus one. Okay? Uh, so, and, and, the, and the proof is actually really quite simple. It's, yeah. Anyway, the, the, this, this, is the, the, this is basically the key to understanding why the Laplacian is special. Because its eigenvalues have this very nice variation um, characterization, I guess. Okay, so the corollary, and it's not very hard. You, know, you, you can easily see, see that. With our estimate on the, on the metrics, um, it, it's very simple to see that uh, this theorem immediately applies the corollary. Okay, so I'm probably pretty much out of time, so I think we have time quite well. Um, the idea that that infimum is just realized by the eigenvectors, by the first k eigenvectors? Probably, yes. I mean, you don't, they don't prove that, I don't think. Oh, I see. Oh. Um, I mean, there's, there's, an old, there's a much older, there's a much older variational characterization where you, um, which is slightly different, due to Rayleigh and Ritz, right? Um, due, due to Rayleigh and Ritz. Um, but unfortunately, it, um, it involves taking infimum and supremum or over orthogonal complements of existing subspaces. And that's not very well suited to what you're doing because the, you're, you're moving around in the space of metrics, and so the L2 and the, the orthogonality constraints are changing. So, the Urukar and Bando's contribution was to realize that there's a different way of thinking of it, which doesn't, doesn't have that complex problem. Okay, so open question. So, first of all, what have we proved? We've proved C0 convergence of this family of metrics to the Fubini symmetric. Now, the reason we're interested in this metric in the first place. Is primarily because of its GD signifier. Of course, it does not follow uh, just because you got, uh, you, just because you have family relationships with converging C zero to some metric. It doesn't follow the GD six conversion to the GD six, right? The GD six equation is an ODE involves the Christoffel symbols. Okay, so although something magic happens for the spectrum of Laplace, we've got no reason to think that something magic happens for the classical GD six flow. So we haven't yet proved that the GD six flow converges to the GD six, just sort of the main result. That uh, secondly, remember I said, well, the, the, this, this limiting metric is very, very symmetric. In particular, it has constant polymorphic section curvature. Well, of course, C0 convergence does not tell you that the curvatures of our family metric converge to the current curvature of the, of, the, of the limiting metric, right? For that, you would need C2 convergence, not just C0. <clears throat> uh, what else? Well, in, in all these statements, there's this thing, there exists a constant C depending on the degree of the line bundle and the, and the, and the, uh, and the geometry of your sphere, such that something is true. So all these bounds have some in independence, which is rather implicit. It's rather difficult to get your hands on exactly what it is. That's interesting, yes, potentially, because one thing you would like to do is use our convergence of spectra results to understand the partition function of a set of quant n quantum vortices moving on the sphere in the limit n goes to infinity. In other words, where you're tending to the thermodynamic, where you have a gas of vortices. For that, you know, for each fixed then of course, you know that the spectrum is converging, but you obviously need some uniformity in n in order to be able to proceed further. Okay, so 
you would really like to understand better the end dependence of these constants which occur in these bounds. Uh, what we've shown is that uh, g epsilon converges in C0 to G0. Of course, there will be an order epsilon correction to that. It will be interesting to know what the, what the leading correction to, to that formula is. Maybe it's something you can actually compute. Uh, and then finally, uh, this was all for vortices on genus zero surface, where your moduli space has this very the Jacobian variety is a point, and your moduli space is, a, is, is always a projective. It's a five. It's a five of uh, fibers of projective spaces over the Jacobian uh, variety. Not um, necessarily not for a bundle. In, right. Well, in in favourable circumstances, it will be a five bundle, right? right. But, but it could have the, things could be jumping in some horrible ways. Right. right. Okay. Let's assume we're in a nice situation where that doesn't happen. Then it's a, then. Even in that case, it's still much more complicated to understand what this limiting metric is going to be. Okay, because now, instead of things collapsing to a point, your moduli space at epsilon to zero is the Jacobi variety, right? So, so there are, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a generalization of this uh, to curves of higher genus, and even formulating exactly what the conjecture is is already difficult. Um, but but it's an interesting one. And these things are all things that uh, Gorton was sitting there in the plaid shirt. Uh, is thinking about is my PhD student. So if you have any ideas, and I'm sure some of you do, talk, tell us. Tell, tell me and Gorton what we should do with this. Yep, that's it. Thanks very much. So we have uh, plenty of time for questions, so I don't know if there's uh, people who want to ask questions. So you mentioned that the geodesic flow with respect to the L2 metric is a, a, an approximation for low energy dynamics of vortices. Is there any possibility that in the dissolving limit, the amount of correctness of this approximation yeah. improves? Yes, uh, that's a good point. So the key thing is you need to understand the Hessian. Uh, no, I don't think I'm just going. You, you need to understand. So something could be happening to the spectrum of the Hessian uh, of this energy function on, on in that in that. Um, so I'm trying to remember how Stuart's. Oh, so what you do is you, you take your. You take the PDE describing the evolution and you rewrite it so that it's of the form you kind of you, the linear part of it is defined by the Jacobi operator associated with the energy function which you're minimizing. And then it has some nice formal properties because this is a global minimizer. Um, so, so the Jacobi operator has some, has some nice properties. Um, but you're right. So that defines some permissivity kind of constant and something nasty could be happening. So yes, even if we prove convergence of the geodesic flow, there is still, that would prove convergence of the geodesic flow. But then uh, Stewart's proof that the geodesic flow is a good approximation to the hyperbolic PDE flow, quite possibly that would fail anyway. And you don't expect it to be true then? Um, you say you don't expect it. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm okay. wondering. Uh, am I, uh, do I, I expect it to be true? I think, yeah, I think you I. Uh, I haven't thought about it I wouldn't be surprised if it was false. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I'm, I, I would not be at all surprised if Stuart's proof doesn't work and is unrecoverable. Uh, but that, of course, doesn't mean that the statement's false. It just means Stuart's proof doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I, this is. I mean, this is a very strange limit. So it wouldn't be surprising if something. Really odd happens in the GDC. Like somehow, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, that's a hard one. Any more questions? Uh, so, your corollary about uh, convergence of the spectrum of mm -hmm. the Laplacian, uh, can you use it to say something? Uh, well, just in, in this Gina Zero case, for the, so quantum, this quantum approximation to. Um, quantum well, mechanics assume, on the model. Yeah, I mean, assuming, well, there you've got, <laughs> you've got extra levels of, of, of uncertainty, right? So, unlike the classical GDS approximation, it isn't even known that the quantum GDS approximation is a good approximation for the quantum field. So, 
setting that aside, and then the extra problem that in this limit, even if it is, you know, something could go wrong here, then yes, of course, you can... But there are these, these, these corrections involving particular uh, types of curvature that people, right? Uh, and said, so can you eliminate some of these? Uh, no, no, you couldn't. No, you couldn't. Uh, so for that, you need to know that the curvatures are converging as well. You need, you need. So if you just take the basic vanilla quantum vortex dynamics, which is just your Hamiltonian is just on the classic, then yeah, this this immediately tells you what your energy spectrum is. With a bit of work, I'm pretty sure you're telling what the uh, the corresponding eigenstates were as well. Uh, but yeah, so as soon as you start adding curvature corrections, then of course you need, you need higher regularity convergence to know that your potential is, is converging to the right thing. Uh, but then of course, yeah, I, I suppose the, the, the curvature terms are going to be very simple because it has constant homomorphic sectional curvature. So, so yes, um, if we could do this thing, then yes, it would tell you. Okay, so let's uh, thank Martin again. So...